Michael Krawitz, and a disabled U U.S. Air Force veteran. Um, main thing that I want to really impart to you today is the intersection between drug testing and medical marijuana and the choices and some of the consequences that that issue brings up. Everything basically in the Veterans Administration Hospital for me went along smoothly. I've never really had trouble. Uh, any treatment that I ever needed, even if there were you know, particular problems in a clinic or with a doctor, uh, within the system I was able to overcome those until I intersected the drug war, until I came face to face with the drug war in my own care in the VA hospital. And where that happened was one day, on my way out of the clinic, the doctor had uh, given a form, that form that's in your book there, the pain contract form, for me to sign. And I don't sign any contract without showing it to my attorney. I immediately told the secretary, uh, well, I'll have to take that with me. And she was aghast that I would leave the, the hospital with this form and show it to my attorney, who then told me not to sign it. He said it wasn't a, a contract in any way, shape, or form, had no legal binding effect. And in fact, a contract uh, agrees to both parties. Uh, I was getting nothing. There, there, it couldn't be a contract because I was agreeing to, to lose rights, not gain anything. And I didn't sign it. I immediately was cut off of my pain medication. Now, in my research, I found more than ample documentation of how patients have used cannabis as an adjunct of therapy with opiates throughout the ages. It's a very important combinative therapy because you reduce the amount of opiates. And right now, being cut off from pain medication is no fun. I can't smoke enough pot to overcome my pain. A small amount of opiates together with the cannabis, I don't have to smoke very much, reduce some of that pulmonary damage, and at the same time, I, I can uh, have very good effective coverage of my pain. So I've been suffering now for about a year where they just have flatly refused and I just will not sign the pain contract. And what the pain contract does, if you read it, is it, it pa paves the way for urine testing, illegal drug urine testing, which has no medical application. It's testing for illegal drugs of abuse on the street that have you know, nothing to do with my care. I'm not a patient that's ever been treated for addiction. You know, there's nothing in my folder that would indicate that there would be any risks that I would uh, be, have any more than any other patient. And there are other patients in my hospital who do the same pain medication, but for cancer or for other things, and they're not forced to sign a pain contract. They're not asked to get urine. And this has really opened my eyes. The research that I've done under this pain contract and this urine testing has really opened my eyes. There are patients all across the board that are affected by this. Patients that are being kicked off of transplant lists, not allowed to get a new liver or kidney because they've tested positive for using medical marijuana in their illegal drug testing. There's people that have been kicked out of public housing that have lost their children in custody battles, all because they've tested positive for using medical marijuana in, in their, in their uh, treatment. So this is a, a huge issue that I stumbled into at, as a veteran issue. And I'm fighting and I'm working with a, a group now at Forum called Veterans for Medical Marijuana Access. And we're trying to take this head on in the VA system because in the VA system, there's no opt-out. If you notice anywhere in drug testing throughout society, there's always an opt-out. If you have drug testing at the workplace, you can opt-out and not get that job. Or if it's at schools, it's only for extracurricular activity. But there's no other VA for me to go to. There's nowhere else for me to go and get my treatment. I'm being barred from my, my treatment because I refuse to submit my urine for the illegal, illegal drug test. I'll submit it for any medical test but I won't submit it for any legal drug test. And this has become a standoff, and, and I've found out a lot about the drug uh, testing document, and, and you here are kind of uh, very few in the clinical community to hear this, I, I know, because I've done the research. And it's very important that you know that these documents are not a medical mandate, they're not pursuant to any federal law. In the VA system, they came down as directives that were given by memo. And in the society at large, if you go to like the uh, American Pain, uh, uh, the, the uh, providers, the American Pain Foundation, uh, the doctors that do specialize in pain, and you look at what they recommend, a pain attestation, it's not offensive, there's nothing about it that it re reduces any you know, rights that the patients have, and it does give them fair warning of the, of the nature of the drugs that they're being given, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you search around on their site, you'll also find a pain contract sample, and people are using these pain contracts across the board throughout the United States, in all these pain clinics and, and in hospitals, when you walk in, you're in pain. According to Dr. Micaria, well over half of medical marijuana patients are fall broadly in some category of pain treatment. So this is very deeply affecting pain. Uh, it deeply affects medical marijuana users. And forcing someone to make a choice between their 
pain medication at the doctor or their cannabis, which they have to get outside the doctor, uh, is a very, very cruel uh, decision to force someone to have to make. In my life, it's caused real damage. I mean, I, I, I have to deal with, like uh, Angel was saying, you, you know, keeping your spirits up is not a small thing to do when you have multiple problems all over your body that literally slow you down like Gilligan's ropes, you know? <laughs> it just... Uh, just a, a little thing, you know, pain, uh, advocacy, the patient that Mary Lynn was talking about, Jim, in the Institute of Medicine report, was one of my pain uh, patient advocacy projects. And when, uh, when Jim, sorry, can I get a glass of water so uh, When Jim was at the VA hospital, um, this is what, right when Prop 215 passed, and the politicians were on TV in Virginia saying, Oh, they legalize marijuana now. You know, watch out. We gotta watch out in Virginia. And there was an old marijuana law in Virginia. So Jim came to me because he had heard on TV that he could grow marijuana legally now in Virginia. And when he came to me, the story that he had at that moment was he was a veteran at the VA hospital, got hepatitis C, they refused to treat him because he was too weak, and they told him to go home and show his kids how to die like a man. That was the advice they gave him at the VA hospital. That was the, the pain, I mean, the patient advocacy project that was dropped in my lap. Um, I brought him to Holland, and I brought him to specialists over there, which gave him alternative treatment, including cannabis, and brought him back to the U.S. with a new prescription for cannabis, which then got him to a buyer's club in Virginia. Yes, there's a buyer's club in Virginia. No, I can't tell you anything more about it. And, uh, because he had a prescription for marijuana when he went in for his treatment, um, they had to duplicate the prescription on his departure from the hospital, and he got a Virginia prescription for the use of cannabis in his treatment, which is a very interesting wormhole through the Virginia law. And uh, he is now, years later, a successfully treated hepatitis C patient who's seen both his, his sons graduate high school, and, uh, you know, it, it, life goes on. I mean, he deals with dip bills and... and uh, the new TV set, and it's amazing every day that he's alive. And um, medical marijuana, it's like, it's not the cure, but it was a, a bridge at a, at a moment when there was no, nothing to help this guy. And that's not an uncommon thing. This is something that I've seen day in and day out out there. And the, the TV likes to you know, show the vending machine that supplies marijuana or you know, portray the, the uh, kid that you know, from the distance, it might seem like he has absolutely nothing wrong with it. Well, talk to that kid, and you may find out that he's got an incurable brain tumor or, you know, uh, suffering from MS and just fighting off the wheelchair. I mean, you'd never know until you, you walk a mile in their shoes. And anytime the government says there's a best medicine, or oh, marijuana's not the best medicine, well, you can't have a best medicine and have individualized care. You just can't do it. So if you want to treat patients as patients, as human beings, with real medical care, you have to treat them as individuals with individualized care. And then you'll hear their stories, and, and then you'll, you'll know. Somebody asked me recently what patient advocacy was, and I, I gave them that. Treating people based on their individual characteristics is no recipe for it. And it's hard as heck. And that's all. That's all. And it, I just want to close with, uh, as a veteran, when you join the military, you sign an oath, you swear an oath, that you'll defend the U.S. Constitution. Not, none of the doctors at the VA hospital or any of the nurses or any of the staff have signed an oath to uphold and defend the U.S. Constitution. And the second, fourth, and fourteenth amendment are violated by this urine testing. I mean, you're not supposed to have to incriminate yourself, you're supposed to be free from unreasonable searches, and laws are supposed to be applied equal to, pe equal to people. These are basic, fundamental rights of the Constitution. So as a veteran, you know, I stand up for the Constitution, I fight for it every day. That, that's what I'm doing. It may look like other things, but that's what I'm doing. So uh, I just want to leave you with that. And all the veterans that are out there, if you can help in your community, there are so many veterans out there right now that are coming back that don't have any services. Um, the, the Air Force and the military are getting people out that have PTSD, but they're getting them out as behavioral problems so that they don't have to treat their medical conditions, and even if they do treat their medical conditions, the VA problems are severe, they're understaffed, and there's all kinds of ways that you can help by contacting your congressman, so I, I appreciate the help with that too. Thank you.